us, Joby? Yes. Hi, is this Joby? This is Tiffany from Crag Radio. Yes, hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Are you more than six feet apart? Uh, well, <laughs> we're family and we live together, so that counts, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me do the official introduction so we can get started here. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor, a painter, and just an all-around great guy. Someone I think I get to finally call my friend. We're very excited to welcome Joby Baker to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Joby. Yes, I'm glad to be with you. You know, I was... This is Terry, by the way, Joby. Uh, I was so jealous because we were watching YouTube videos the other night and up on the screen came American Bandstand and you were on there being interviewed by Dick Clark and, and Tiffany, who's my daughter, turned to me and said, I've talked to both of those people. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, uh, someone told me that um, that interview was, um, I don't remember doing it, but then someone showed me where to look and I saw it, I was just, amazed that Joby Baker ever had an interview with Dick Clark. And, and you know the thing is, it was so cool, is did you see all the girls that were swooning over you in the audience? <laughs> no. <laughs> the, no, they, what are you saying? The, they were looking at you like you were Elvis Presley yourself. I mean, they, they were like, wow, he's good looking. And you are. You're a good looking guy. Thank you. I'm sure you're a good-looking guy, too. <laughs> well, I have a face for radio. But you I, have what? I have a face for radio. Oh, I see, yes. Yeah. But well, I wanna... you, could grow, you could grow a beard, you could have three ears, it doesn't matter. Exactly, exactly. Now, so uh, you, guys, you guys live together? Yes, yes. Uh, we're father and Are daughter. You... You're what? We're father and daughter. Oh, that's so interesting. It's great. It's interesting, except when I get mad at her. And then it's not so interesting. But you still got to work with her, you know, so. Well, you know, I can relate to that. I have daughters. And um, I've got how many daughters? I have two daughters. And then I have two stepdaughters. I hate the word step. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But I'm just crazy about them all. Fantastic. Well, I wanted to find out, because uh, it's interesting to people to kind of know uh, what you've been doing, you know, these past years and everything, because everybody knows you as Joby Baker, the actor, but now you're a full-fledged, all-the-time painter. Uh, you paint portraits, right? No, I'm a figurative painter. Okay. And what is No, it? I don't paint port portraits. I paint uh, figures. Um... It's hard to describe, but you could Google me and see some of the things. Have you ever done that? Have you ever looked at what I do? I have, yes, yes. Do you like them? Yes, I do. I think they're they're beautiful. They're very interesting, and and uh, dare I say, and upset any people, any painters that are portrait artists. But I think that they're a lot more thought provoking than just kind of like a portrait or a bowl of fruit. Well, exactly. Portraits are, well, great portraits are great. I mean, great, great painters have done great portraits. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what to tell you. Well, kind of describe, like, what some of the paintings you've done. Uh, I, I take it it's not landscapes either, so uh, is it kind of abstract or? Well, you know what? I suggest you go online and, 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 Tell me what you think. Okay. Not, I can't describe what I do. Wow. I just do it, and I have been doing that all my life. Well, I know you told Dick Clark, because Dick Clark was surprised, because you were even painting back in the 60s. And no, I've always painted, but I remember saying that you don't have to be tall or short, or you don't have to look like a, a sailor or whatever. Like you do when you're an actor, you go into to get interviewed, and you have to fit their idea of what would be fine for the part right but as a painter i don't i don't have to audition well there I you go i think that i can i could control what i want to do and be alone and paint which is a wonderful thing to do so uh, basically uh you you have art shows and and you're in galleries or uh yes of course i have been had i've been having shows 
for years and years. Fantastic. Wow. So I got to know, with all the Hollywood friends you have, did you ever do any uh, paintings for them? A lot of them. Now, the, the big... Well, I, don't, I didn't do them for them. That right. They came to the show and bought them. Right. I can't remember who has them, but uh -huh. I think a lot of people do. Yeah. Very cool. Now, the big question, though, is that it can, can anybody... I mean, I guess if they just go to a showing or whatever, but... If somebody, let's say that they can't get to one of your art shows, but they want to buy one of your paintings, can anybody buy one? Um, of course. Well, there you go. And I suggest to fans, that's probably the coolest way to get your autograph. Exactly. Is to buy a painting because you actually signed the thing. But Well, you know, I, I know that um, I, ever since I was an actor, mm -hmm. um, I, I really... I really didn't do very many autographs for anybody. Uh -huh. I just have a feeling that uh, waiting around for someone to scratch their name on a piece of paper. I don't. I don't understand autograph seekers, or I just don't. I just don't get it. But anyway, I've I've done very few autographs, and now I find out that. My my name on a piece of paper is valuable. Absolutely. I, I want you to know that you've got a lot of fans out there still. And, and you're a humble guy. I guess when Tiffany called you, you couldn't believe that we actually wanted to do you uh, on, on the radio here and have an interview. You said that you haven't done this in over 40 years, and you couldn't even understand why. I guess you didn't understand. No, I, I still don't understand why. <laughs> and I don't understand why Good Morning World was attracted to attractive to so many people it, it was more a, than nine people it, it, it was attractive to me because i'm in radio and, and i know what it's like and it gets crazy and i think that pretty well covered it it was a great show oh i understand i could understand why you liked it yeah yes yeah it was about two guys doing early morning radio right and, and had a great cast. Of course, we had ronnie shell on uh a few weeks back you told me yes you told me that ronnie was on and, and Ronnie's doing well. And, and, uh, and what kind of questions did you ask Ronnie Shell? Well, I asked him questions about Good Morning World. Uh, like about what? Well, for instance, I had said to him, okay, I want to ask you about who you acted with. And I said, maybe you know this guy. He likes to say, picky, picky, picky. <laughs> now, do you know who I'm talking about? Billy DeWolf. Yes. <laughs> what was Billy now, like? Billy DeWolf, there were two people on that show that were very important to me. Uh -huh. They were great people, great human beings. Billy DeWolf and Julie Parrish. Yeah. Julie Parrish is no longer on the planet. Mm. She was really one of the most amazing actresses. She Do you know who Julie Parrish is? Yes, oh, absolutely. Course, Love course. her. She was beautiful. And, and you know, your, your chemistry on that show, it, it really came through the screen. I mean, you could kind of see behind the screen and know that you guys were more than likely good friends in real life. I mean, you could see that. No, we're, we're very good friends. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and we, we stayed to, oh, you know, the, uh, Billy DeWolf and Julie Parrish and I uh, hung out together a little bit. All the rest of the people in the cast, I hardly knew. Uh -huh. mm. I, I worked with Ronnie Shell, but I really didn't know what was going on with him. Yeah, that he was a comic. I understand that. Um, Goldie Hawn was in the Goldie Hawn business, so I don't know what was <laughs> going on with her. Right. Well, Goldie Hawn definitely was in the Goldie Hawn business, and and I always had a crush on her. And uh, on one episode of Good Morning World, she was actually in a bathing suit, and I went nuts because she <laughs> she was so cute. And, and Ronnie Shell told us that well, he, well, he was cute in a bathing suit too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he almost got in a bathing suit because one of my favorite episodes of Good Morning World was when you and Ronnie was at a nudist camp. Oh God! Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I, I take it you weren't totally naked, right? I mean, you, you had, like, something on. No, I was totally naked. Everybody on this, in the cast was naked, and the, and the, the cameraman and the director, everybody was naked, so nobody felt embarrassed. <laughs> and the audience, the audience was naked. 
so really, you guys, honestly, what you're saying, Joby, is that you guys were kind of the first production of Hair, which did the public nudity thing. You, you just <laughs> ripped that Band-Aid right off. Absolutely. Are you kidding? <laughs> wow. So what was it like? Now tell me, what, uh, um, Terry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, did you did you work for a, a radio station and did you do disc jockey or were you a um, a reporter or an anchor guy or what? Well, I was a disc jockey and a show host and I've been doing it for forty two years now. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and, and believe it or not, my old boss at my first station uh, just passed away at the age of ninety eight. So he he lived a long time and and he was he was the guy who got me started. And who was that? Uh, Mr. Joe Salvi, and the station was WLUV. It was in a little town called Rockford, Illinois. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Well, I've heard of Rockford, Illinois, yes, of course. But I don't know the radio station. But, I mean, you've got a history. That's just so interesting. I've got a history of, of being known and being heard, but not quite being as famous as Joby Baker. So, if, if No, I... well, you have to understand that in Rockford, Illinois, you were well-known... Uh, did you did you like that? Did you like being well known? It, it was nice. It had its ups and downs. It, it was really nice one day when I went to uh, have supper at a restaurant. And the waitress said, "I just listened to your show, and the meal's on me." Now that was fun. Oh, that is the best. I remember <laughs> when when I had Good Morning World. Yeah. Um, I went to a restaurant with my wife, and there was a whole lineup of people waiting to get in and someone recognized me and gestured with their hand to come with them and then we ate in the kitchen and it was incredible they set up a table in the kitchen and um, the chef had a great sense of humor and he was he put lobsters on the floor and we had a lobster race Oh, God, you've got to miss the 60s, Joby. I mean, man, well, you know, I was not interested in stardom. Yeah. I, I, in fact, I was embarrassed by it, and I was the wrong type of person to be an actor, and strangely enough, I was an actor for years and years. I was even a nightclub stand-up comic. And I was embarrassed all those years. Well, you know, that's kind of a, it kind of leads to an interesting question, though, Joby, because how did you actually get into doing, you know, the, the stand up and then eventually the acting? Because, I mean, you had been a painter forever, and then you kind of had mentioned that you were embarrassed by it and blah, blah, blah. So, how did you actually even get into the business? What happened? Well, I, it's, it's a very interesting question. I, I really don't know, but I was, I think basically, shy but people that knew me would have never said that I was shy um, I worked in Las Vegas and uh, with Abbott and Costello and oh. it was amazing to come out on the stage and I used to swing on the curtains uh, <laughs> with this huge band behind me it was just incredible but before I went on I was scared to death and while I was on, I was okay. When I came off, I kind of shook. Yeah, that's when and you pass I, out. And I had done that for, I don't know how many years. Right. Well, also, I, I, go ahead. I don't know. You know, it's very strange. Um, well, also, it's kind I'm of... I'm in a good place now. Kind I should have never been... <laughs> uh, well, when I was a little boy, my mother and father told me that I always said that I wanted to be an MC, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what an MC was, but it was something that I wanted to do, probably to be on the radio, like you, Terry, you know? Well, you know, the, the thing about Good Morning World, and we had talked to Ronnie Shell about this too, because I, I guess he had a, a friend that owned a radio station and ran a radio station, and he was on the air uh, over there practicing basically for the role. That, that being a stand-up comic uh, kind of has good training for being on radio. I imagine that helped you, didn't it? Oh, sure. It all, everything everything helped me. I used to do impressions before I, I, uh, I had someone or I wrote my nightclub act. I must tell you this, though. I worked in some of the wonderful, important nightclubs in America uh -huh. with the worst act you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> oh, my. 
<laughs> well, it's amazing to me that you work with Abbott and Costello. Now, now, how do you follow that? I mean, or, I guess you came out first, but man, they're like. Well, the, it was you know, it was a review while I was in the army. Um, I was in special service, uh-huh. and my partner in the army was a guy named James Mobley, who was married to Patty Costello, uh, 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 Lou Costello's daughter. Right. And he convinced Lou Costello to come up to the, to the camp and do a show. And while I was up there, I got to be friendly with Lou Costello, and on the weekends, he would invite me and his son-in-law, Jimmy, to his house in 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 uh, San Fernando Valley. Wow. And we used to stay with him. And it was right after his little boy, Butchie, died in yeah. the pool. Yeah, that's too bad. And he was the saddest man you've ever seen. It was just heartbreaking. But at the same time, he still had a, an amazing sense of humor. Right. You know, a lot of people... Know, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, a lot of people, like, they made a bio pick on him. Uh, uh, Abbott and Costello, and and a lot of people came off or gave the impression that there was kind of a rift between Bud and Lou Abbott and Costello. That the Costello was a little hard to deal with. Did, did you see any of that? No, 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 no. Wait a minute. The other way around. Mm. Oh. Bud Abbott was hard oh. because he was a drunk. Yeah. That and went on. Lou on. Costello was bothered by by him being inu- inebriated all the time because they had routines they had to do together. Yeah. And Bud Abbott, you couldn't depend on Bud Abbott right. because he was, uh, well, he was an alcoholic. Yeah, yeah. That, that can definitely make it hard to deal with. Lou Costello did not drink. He did not smoke. No, he was the most amazing guy. In fact, at one period after he and I, after I worked with him at the Sahara in Las Vegas, he signed me, and he was my manager. Wow, that's incredible! You know, Isn't you kind of kind of had a history with, with comedy uh, duels in, in a way, because I know that you know with Noah and Lou and everything. But uh, one of my favorite episodes of Good Morning World was the episode about Laurel and Hardy. I don't remember that. Well, it was a great episode. I'll tell you what, if, if you get Amazon Prime, all the episodes of Good Morning World is now on Amazon Prime, and it, it's feeding to a whole new generation now. Well, you know something I have? In fact, I'm looking at it. I'm in my bedroom, and I'm looking at a box, and it has all the Good Morning World shows in that box, and I don't think I've seen more than two. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great show. I love it. It's a fantastic show. Well, that's so, that's great that's wonderful um you know you ought to interview persky and denoff if they're still alive and yeah. Yeah. find out more about how this show came up uh how it was created and how they got the name good morning world now do you have any idea uh, about why or the story behind how uh the show got delayed a year because i heard that it was delayed for a year because they went off and was working on something else i never heard that Oh, okay. Yeah, I had read, and it might be incorrect, but I had read that... I think it is incorrect. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, why would I know about that? I mean, you see, um, I was working... I, I did a... On La Siena, are you guys calling from California? Yes, we are. Okay, so I had a, a gallery on La Siena called the McKenzie Gallery, and I was doing a show, mm-hmm. a, a painting show there. And... Um, Hold on a second. I I, I had a, a a mind freeze. Sure, no problem. Uh, anyway, so oh my, God, I can't believe that I can't remember. Uh, Joby, I have the okay. same problem. I can't remember what happened yesterday. Uh, so. I have the same problem, and I'm only thirty six. So you know. <laughs> oh yeah, well that made me feel much better <laughs> anyway so I, I will I'll figure out but a, a great a great writer walked in uh-huh. and um, he mentioned that he was doing um, a play uh, at the Coronet Theater called The Wonderful Ice Cream Suit and he said would you like to audition for it and I said sure 
And I went down there and I auditioned and I got the part. And it was the part of a, a Mexican guy. Mm-hmm. And um, so we were, this play ran for maybe three years. And during that time, um, the producers of Good Morning World came in and saw me. And um, they thought I was rather good in the play. Was this the writer? I, I, was this the writer Ray Bradbury? Yes. I'm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Ray Bradbury wrote the, the wonderful ice cream soup. Yes, right. yes. And I guess it was a big so, thing for you because you were a big fan, right? I love Ray Bradbury. Yeah. I became a good friend of his. Yes, he was a a lovely man. You know, he was not in the Ray Bradbury business. He was a a really wonderful person. So anyway, the character I played was called Vamanos. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it was a story about three or four guys that all shared one white suit, thinking that it would make their life better. And when Vamanos put on the suit, they were worried that he was, he was a, uh, uh, a grease monkey, and they were worried that he would dirty it. <laughs> so they all watched out for Vamanos. And most of the play that I did in this character was I made up my lines, and Ray Bradbury <clears throat> was off stage writing down what I said. <laughs> wow. You know, a, a, as the character, the character was amazing. So, um, so if you get the play and read it, mm-hmm. all of the dialogue of Vamanos was made up on the stage. Wow. So well, you kind of... So anyway, these guys came in to see me. I guess the word got around, you got to see this guy that's playing this Mexican. Mm-hmm. You can't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. you got to really be Mexican. <laughs> I had a, you know, a, a, a white Jewish guy was playing a Mexican. I mean, you can't do that anymore. Right. Now, knowing that, knowing that you had done stand-up and, and worked the circuit and things like that, and knowing even from just knowing your personality, you're a very funny guy, um, then, interestingly, you kind of started getting cast as, like, the teen but very good-looking leading man type. I mean, you know, you were you were kind of like the boy next door, but also like the cool teen guy. Um, weren't really always the comic relief. How did you feel about that? I mean, when we're talking about doing roles like you did in Girl Happy and, and, and the Gidget films and things like that, how did you feel about that kind of well, You know, I was casting? under contract to Columbia Pictures, so you do whatever they say. Got it. Got well, it. I think you very well fit that role of the swinging 60s guy. Uh, if, if well, you... I don't, you know, you're describing somebody that I don't even recognize. I do, I do know that I was cast as, in Disney, I was playing a Mexican bandit on a horse. Right. Yeah, that was in Bullwhip Griffin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I did a lot of pictures for Disney. You did, yeah. One of our one of our fates or favorites is Bullwhip, but also um, uh, Blackbeard's Ghost. Wasn't that good? It was now, fun. I've got to ask you because you got to do a great scene with the great Peter Usinoff that played Blackbeard's Peter Ghost. Peter was my my dearest friend from that movie. Wow. And and you know at the time I was also a photographer and I did a series of portraits uh, of of Peter Ustinov, and he was the best subject I ever had. He was he so was funny. fabulous. The, the scene where, as Blackbeard's ghost, of course, you know, nobody could see him except for Dean Jones, and, and you're the bad guy. You're the guy that runs a casino and, and the guy that kind of right. like, yeah, the bad guy. And, and Blackbeard's ghost kind of like takes you and, and flips you up in the air, and of course nobody can see it, but, but you know, Dean Jones or whatever. So you're seeing yourself flip in the air, and there's nobody there. How did they do that? Were you on wires? Do you remember that? Yes, I was on wires. <laughs> wow, that had to be uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was another thing where I was knocked out, and I hit my head on a, a slot machine, and the money came out and yes. all over my head. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yes, yes. and then came out of your well, mouth. The only reason I remember it is that when we did it, they used real coins and I was injured Oh! from all those coins hitting me in the head. And they stopped the production and the prop department made plastic coins and we reshot it 
with plastic coins that didn't hurt me. There you go. Incredible. Walt Disney was a terrific guy. I got to find out about working on the Disney sets because everybody assumes that it's all family friendly and everybody's nice. We got a chance to work on a Disney show one time. They were so mean. <laughs> I don't know how they no, treated you. What show was that? I don't even remember the name of it. It was some uh, TV. It was, it was called That Was Then. It that was, was then. It was a, a show in like. But that wasn't. That was a, Walt. Was no. Walt alive? No, it was. Days? It was way after Walt was gone. Well, there you go. That's much different. Everybody called him Walt. So I take it you definitely met Walt Disney then. Oh, I, yes, of course I did. He he sent for me when they cast Silky Seymour for uh, Blackbeard's Ghost. Uh -huh. um, he saw a lot of really famous actors for that part and he invited me to lunch at the, in the commissary I remember what I had I started with shrimp cocktail with Louis dressing and lamb chops mm. <laughs> really good nice. and then at one point he asked me to laugh <laughs> and that was your audition that was my audition wow. That's yes, all and, I, and I got the part and then I had done more movies with him uh, I can't remember the ones I did with Walt Disney, but that was a wonderful studio. Now I had I had read, and and maybe you this is the chance to tell me if I'm wrong or not. I had read that that Walt was actually considering you, that Disney was actually considering you to play Barnaby in their version of Babes in Toyland. Was that true? I never heard that one. Yeah, you would have been the villain opposite Annette Funicello. Oh, Annette from the cello. I, I don't know if you're if you've ever seen uh, Babes in Toyland, but man, you would have been perfect. I never would have believed that you could play a villain until I saw Blackbeard's Ghost, and you were very good at it. You know something when you say play a villain. If the part says that you're a villain, then they dress you like a villain. Yeah. Then they give you a mustache, and then they give you cigars to smoke, and they tell you to you know talk very quietly and and uh, then you become a villain there you go if the part says you're a villain you become a villain right all it that doesn't definitely take any acting to put on a you know a, a well a, a, a well-fitting dark suit and a stylish hat and wear a mustache it i don't know it i i don't know well I, i've got to ask you because you you've acted uh with so many people that I love so much. And in Blackbeard's Ghost, you got to act with Dean Jones. Now, what was he like? Was he a really nice guy? or He was just a regular American boy. There you go. All American, that's for sure. Yep. I didn't hang out with him. Yeah. I hung out with Peter Ustinov. Yeah. Now, I know yeah. that you had mentioned you had mentioned that around that time uh, that you were also a photographer. Uh, you got you worked on another Disney film with somebody else who was also into photography and video, and that was Roddy McDowell, which you were in Bullwhip Griffin. Did you get along? No, with Roddy him? McDowell was a photographer also. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys uh, shoot anything together? Or did you guys get along? How was he? I don't know. I don't know that uh, uh, that movie we did together where I played a Mexican bandit. I don't know if we had any scenes together. Mm. Um, it was a, that was a, a, a kind of a big Disney production. Um, di did you ever see that movie? We were actually going to see it tonight. Yeah, we haven't seen that one yet, but we're going to for sure. Oh, that's good. Well, you'll see me, and, I, and the outfit that I'm wearing in that movie was Marlon Brando's in One-Eyed Jacks. Wow. Wow. I guess you work with a lot of photographers because in, in one of the Disney films, uh, you work with Bob Crane. I mean, he was in that film. I don't know if he had Super scenes Dad. together. Super Dad. But uh, some of the photos he took, we can't talk about. But <laughs> <laughs> for what no, I but I didn't know. I didn't know him. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, so, I mean, okay. So, obviously, if we're talking about your career, Joby, we cannot... We would be remiss if we did not mention your co-starring role in Girl Happy with, oh, a little somebody that people might know by the name of Elvis Presley. So uh, what kind of a guy was Elvis, and what was it like working on that film? I mean, you were you played Elvis's drummer in the film. You had a big part. Right. Well, I was a drummer at one time. But the thing is, Elvis was a very kind, interesting guy. 
and I used to sit in his dressing room with him and listen to black uh, uh, black religious music. Yes, mm-hmm. and he was very interested in medicine. Very cool. And uh, I remember one time a girl came and knocked on his trailer, and he let her in, and she handed him. Um, a box with a, wa- a wristwatch in it, and it was a Patek Philippe watch, uh-huh. and I think he didn't know the difference, and he said thank you, and he just put it in a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> so I take it that's a I very said, expensive well, well, watch. Well, if you're not going to use it, <laughs> why didn't you why didn't you give it back to her? Right. And he said because it would have broken her heart. Well. Wow. Yeah, he really was so a nice he, guy. Yeah. He knew his who who uh, who they were dis- who they were talking about. He knew he knew who that Elvis part was. Right. I was I was married to a girl that did a movie with him called Blue Hawaii. Yeah, Joan Blackman. Did Elvis introduce yeah. you, or did, did did you meet through Elvis? Or no, no, I was married to her when she got the part and went to Hawaii, and that was the end of the marriage. Wow. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, that's the way. <laughs> that's the way things go. But 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 uh, I because I told I, we were married for one year and twenty four days. Right. You know, I had a grandmother that was married overnight. She got a divorce the next day. So, that's a long time. Well, it sounds like sounds like my my story. Mm. So what an happened? overnight marriage. Oh yeah, my God! What happened? It does happen. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah. <laughs> and you actually married uh, the ex-wife of composer Andre Previn. Dory Previn Dory was one Previn. of the great people I ever met in my life. Wow. Yeah. Do you are you familiar with her work? Sure. Yes. And I guess you even illustrated a, a book to uh, a songbook. A songbook of hers. I did. Yeah. yeah, I did. Bob Trotter, it's called. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's amazing. I, I mean, she was, a, she was one of the smartest people I ever met, and the greatest lyricist that we've we've got in this country. Unfortunately, people people don't know that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I definitely know her, and I knew her ex husband, and and uh, definitely a great lady. It's amazing to know. I mean, with all the connections you had and everybody you hung around, you were only married three times, right? Right, but you know, when she died, Andre never even called up. Really? Uh, he he was kind of a prick. Yeah. yeah. With well, a big orchestra. Yeah. That's the way it goes. I got to find out now. When you were in Girl Happy, uh, another one of my crushes that you got to act with that I was totally in love with was Shelley Fabres. Now, what do you think about her? Well, she told me a lot about you. She says, you know, this guy <laughs> is crazy about me, this poor guy, Harry. You know, and he keeps looking at me, and uh, he's a creep, creepy guy, that Terry. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the thing with Girl Happy that was amazing to me is she actually broke my heart in that movie because I was so used to her being like the girl next door in the Donna Reed show, and, and then she gets drunk in the movie and kind of acts like a stripper. And, and I don't even remember that. <laughs> I don't even think I saw that movie. But um, I guess you figured out by now that those things didn't impress me very much. Right, right. Well, well that's what I, I like I about was you. Mostly interested in art. Yeah. yeah. Down to earth kind of guy. I got to find out about some of the other people in Girl Happy because uh, one of the uh, guys in your band uh, was Gary Crosby, who was Bing Crosby's son. Uh, I would yeah, assume Gary is a nice was a nice guy. I, I'll bet you Elvis was very interested in Gary because I think he was a big uh, Bing Crosby fan. Did did you ever hear any of him? You know, asking no, questions? No, I don't or? think so. No, Elvis Presley was Elvis Presley. My God, he was. Um, I didn't realize how amazing he was until years later. I remember one time I asked him. You know, I said, "You're really a good actor." Mm-hmm. And 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 a good singer. But why do you do all this stupid music? You know, in these movies. Right. He said because I owe it to the people around me. This is what gives them their livelihood. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted to break away, but uh, the colonel wouldn't let him. Yeah. See, that's the magic thing. There is actually a movie coming out about Colonel Parker, 
with uh, Tom Hanks. But Colonel Parker kind of had a bad reputation, I guess. You know, first of all, he wouldn't let Elvis uh, go overseas. He wouldn't let him do shows in Europe. And come to find no, out, he it's, wouldn't. You know why? He, Colonel Parker had a warrant out for his arrest. That's why. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. He, he was a he was a terrible person. Well, the first time I I ran into him, I was on one sound stage rehearsing for a movie, and Elvis was on another sound stage next door, uh, getting ready to do a movie. Uh-huh. And Colonel Parker used to send uh, telegrams to all the all the actors who are starting a film. And he sent a telegram to me to miss Joby Baker. Oh. Oh, God. Wow. So I went next door with this telegram to Elvis. And I said to him, what's this shit? <laughs> he says, he says, I'm sorry, Miss Joby. <laughs> <laughs> and then from that time on, we we were rather good acquaintances. Well, see, you should have given it right back to Elvis, because I don't know if you remember or not, but there's a scene in Girl Happy where Elvis was dressed up like a woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, do you remember me telling you I never saw that movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to watch it. you got to be seeing it. it. It's a great movie. But yeah, Colonel Parker definitely, and you're right, his, his movie songs were terrible. Yeah, I felt bad for Elvis, but I guess he was he was stuck with the, the Colonel. The Colonel kind of made him a star, but yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I just don't think about those guys anymore. Well, you know, I'm glad to find out that you were a drummer, because I had told Tiffany last night, because we watched Girl Happy again last night, that, that I was very convinced you knew how to play, and now I find out you did. I mean, you were very convincing. I did know how to play. Yeah. When, when they yeah. did the songs and, and they did the tracks, now, each of you had like the little background part or, or whatever. Did, did you sing any of those lines for real, or was that all studio musicians? That, no, no, no. We, sa- we, we sang whatever you heard was live. Uh-huh. I think we went to a sound stage and recorded that, and then we dubbed that in. There you go. Now, one of the things that I was curious about, Joby, is that, I mean, you you kind of had, and knowing especially that you were under contract with Columbia, um, you kind of had the image in a lot of these films, like they could have been grooming you to be like another Frankie Avalon or a Fabian or somebody like like that. Did they ever come to you and want you to maybe start doing a recording career? You know what? I was more of a character actor. I was not a leading man. Uh, The movie that I was brought to Columbia for was a movie with a, a great American actor named Paul Muni. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Called The Last Angry Man. Mm-hmm. And that was like a serious, great, dramatic movie. And I never got a chance at that studio to do another movie like that. Right. I played Stinky and Gidget. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, but that was a great pop culture film. I mean, talk about the 60s. That's right there on the screen. I mean, The Last Angry Man was a wonderful movie with Cicely Tyson and Billy De Williams. Uh-huh. Right. So I take it you preferred uh, dramatic uh, roles rather than, you know, your comedy or, or swinging 60s type films. Well, let me, how, how can I, how can I uh, describe that to you? I think an actor is interested in getting involved in something intelligent. Uh-huh. Right. When you're handed a script and you're sitting on the beach with sand down your pants <laughs> and you're worried about the waves, I mean, what kind of a drama is that? Right, right. Well, you know, at the time, okay, when you did the film, now you were in the first Gidget movie, you did three, and uh, I, uh, having to work with Sandra D, I mean, that couldn't have been all bad. I didn't know her very much. Your mother was there, wouldn't let anybody talk to her. Really? Uh, she wound up marrying Bobby Darren. I don't know if she was married to him at the time, but... Uh, no, she wasn't married at the time. He was a great guy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. One of our great and losses. Jimmy Darren and I are still friends. We talk to each other on the phone very often. Oh, nice. Hey, you know, he still looks good. I mean, he kept his looks and... Oh, and, my God, he looks fantastic. Yeah. Uh, wow. I, I think you could have been Moondoggy. You definitely could have done that role. Well, you know, I 
you're talking about these movies like they're uh, the Godfather. I, <laughs> you're really in, into the, these movies. I don't even understand that. I was born, lived, and raised at the drive-in movie, Joby. So yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> And, and I gotta let you know, okay, I'm telling you all these women you've been with and acted in films that, that I fell in love with. One of the Gidgets that you got to act with, and, and God, such a beautiful person, and somebody else is called Deborah Wally. Deborah Wally was a Gidget. She played Gidget once mm -hmm. in Hawaii, I think. Yes, yes. And what was she like? Gidget, I mean, uh, was she, she compared to Sandra she, D, who do you like better, Sandra D or Deborah Wally? I think I think they're both stupid. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that I, that is good about them is that that they realized that Terry Dufault was crazy about them. <laughs> there you go. Well, if we want to talk about movies that you think is stupid, Terry, how old are you? I'm sixty-three. Well, Jesus, I think by now you really realize that a Gidget, Gidget movies were stupid. <laughs> Okay, so so what, in your opinion, was more stupid? And, and I'll throw this out there because I know we talked about it earlier. Wait a minute, slow down. What, what are you? Because you're you're off mic. Okay, sorry. I was gonna say I know that we talked about this earlier, Joby. So which of these do you think is more stupid, the Gidget movies or the epic film Hoot Nanny Hoot? Oh, honey, <laughs> they're they're together in the same genre. <laughs> Really? You think you think uh, Hoot Nanny Hoot is is the same as Gidget? Like I thought they were both great. <laughs> Terry, I'm really getting worried about you now. <laughs> I mean, just think about it. Not only was it a Hoot Nanny, it was a Hoot Nanny circus. <laughs> uh, where do you find that? I mean, it's it's magic. Johnny, Johnny Cash, that was really amazing. Yes. That. Was, it, was Johnny Carson in that movie too? No, Johnny no. Carson was not, but Johnny Cash definitely was. Johnny Cash and uh, Chev Woolley, who did Purple People Eater, that yeah, great song, and and the Brothers Four, and uh, right, and, and it was a great film, and 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 the, Ruta Lee, and Ru and and you got to star with somebody that was our guest, who was on another show. I know, I, uh, Ruta is a wonderful person. Well, I I well, I saw her in that baby doll. You know that the little nighty thing. I was like, "Wow!" Well, so there's three girls that you're crazy about now. That, <laughs> that um, Jesus, you know, I don't. Uh, <laughs> Tiffany, yes, what yes. are we going to do about that? I don't know. I don't know. I, I sometimes I think he just does the radio show so he can try to talk about his crushes. Well, it could be. It's very interesting to me. I would like to interview him. Well, you know, maybe you could hook me up because I'm sure you've got some girls hanging no, around listen, you. And... Hey, Ter listen, I can't hook you up anymore. Yeah, because you're married. I, I live on a farm in a little teeny town. <laughs> well, I must tell you, with the guys that you hung out with, which was Elvis Presley and people like Ricky Nelson, you work with Ricky Nelson, I can imagine. Ricky Nelson lived right next door to me. Really? Oh. You were not only on uh, Ozzy and Harriet, but you were in a movie with Ricky, too. I was. Yeah. Ricky was a terrific guy. We did the wackiest shift in the army yes. together with Jack Lemmon. See, those were good movies. Those weren't stupid movies. Right. Well, the thing is, you know, uh, about Girl Happy and, and Hoot Nanny Hoot, I mean, they were major studios. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, one Let me tell you something. Yeah. There was a producer at MGM, and his fa his fame was that if any... <clears throat> I think I'm getting the, the virus now I'm talking about. But oh, say that. What he was famous for was to make a movie about things that were a hit in America at the time, like if Yo-Yo, if people really love Yo-Yo, He'd make a movie about yo-yos uh -huh. or hula hoops. He would make a movie about hula hoops. And then folk songs, folk singers and folk songs came out, and he made a movie called Hoot Nanny Hoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and that's what he did. Let, before, before, <clears throat> we, before we wrap up here, um, I, I did want to ask you about, uh, there was uh, some TV shows that you did uh, that were fantastic. Um, one that I really enjoyed is I like watching the old episodes of Dragnet. 
and you were in three episodes of Dragnet. What was Jack Webb really as stern? He was, he was a prick. He was a prick. Yeah, really? we we had a guest yeah. on that said the only time Jack was nice was when he was drunk. One time I was sitting off off camera waiting to do a scene, and I had a leather jacket on. It was part of the wardrobe, mm -hmm. and you know. If it's really, really quiet, and you move your arm, leather makes a sound. Right. right. Of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course. And he was starting to scream at me because of this jacket was making. He was not a nice guy. Mm. Mm. Can't say I'm really surprised. I'll tell you that. who was a great guy. You want to know? Who? Yes, who? Cl Cl Klugman. Oh, Jack Klugman? He was the best. Wow. And you know who else? Who? Van Dyke. Dick, Dick Van, Van Dyke. Dyke. And, and you know, it was kind of thanks to Dick Van Dyke in a way through uh, the producer Carl Reiner that you got Good Morning World. Well, when Van Dyke went off the air, they needed to find another replacement for Van Dyke. Yeah. And they decided it was me. Mm -hmm. And they were going to call it the Joby Baker Show. In fact, I have a ticket from CBS that says the Joby Baker Show. And I went to these guys and I begged them, please, please, don't call it the Joby Baker Show. Yeah. And I convinced them not to. It's too much, I mean, too, too much responsibility right. for, a pa for a painter who might be in a terrible TV show, you know. <laughs> So I, know I told you I was, shy, I was shy and I was nervous about stardom. I didn't, I did not, well, I was only a star for, what, how many days? <laughs> 24 episodes. <laughs> well, you know, it, it speaks to your personality and your character, though, Joby, because you are very down to earth and, and you do not have that arrogance or conceit. So that's part of it, too. Well, a couple of movies... You remember I, I mentioned that the Goldie Hawn, she was doing the Goldie Hawn, uh, her Goldie Hawn show, yes. or the uh, Carl Reiner show. These people, all they thought about was to uh, to do uh, to um, to. Oh, jeez! But to kind of like market themselves, right? Yes, that's all they. But you know, movie stars. It's a very, very difficult thing to be a star mm -hmm. because all you do is think about yourself all the time because you're, you're, you're the shop, you know, you're the business. Right. And so you really can't get to know anybody that's doing uh, th themselves. It's like Donald Trump. All he thinks about is himself. Yeah. <laughs> there you well, go. These, these movie stars... In order to be a movie star, you have to be uh, to think about yourself all the time. I mean, can you imagine being Brad Pitt and say, "I'm going to go down to the corner and get a cheeseburger"? Yeah, yeah, it'd be hard. Uh, your relationship uh, with with Ronnie Shell. Now, you kind of came off like like you were a little competitive on the show. Were you competitive in real life? I mean, were you pretty friendly? No, I didn't even. I hardly even talked to him. Yeah, he talked well the only of you. People I talked to was. Billy DeWolf and uh, the lady that played my wife. Yeah. Julie Parrish, yeah. Ronnie Shell spoke very well of you. He did say that he remembered, and this was Ronnie that was saying it, that you had trouble remembering lines in Good Morning World. I had a terrible time remembering lines. And the more nervous I would get about remembering lines, uh, the harder it was for me to remember lines. That I had did to a be. show called uh, Six O'Clock Follies where yes. I start yeah. uh, as a, 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 a captain in the army or something. And I had no problem with that. I think it was the background and the people around Good Morning World that, that got me nervous. They were so worried that if you miss a line or you miss you know one sentence that they thought was funny that you're screwing up their show. The reason I got this show in the first place because I made up stuff on the stage uh, for for the wonderful ice cream suit. Right. That's what that's what got their attention. And then when they g picked me, then they wanted me to uh, 
say everything they wrote, and what they wrote was not that great. <laughs> I was funnier than that than them. I, I would have thought that there was some improv in Good Morning no World. Improv. Oh, really? Oh. Because you know, when you turn around, one of my favorite parts, because having been in radio and everything, I know it's not like that. But you guys would make up commercials just off the top of your head, and. and yeah, yeah uh, we did that. In fact, uh, before we went on the air uh, TV show, we uh, w- we did a radio show uh, in Hollywood, a, lo- a local radio show yeah. with all kinds of props and funny horns and things. Right. I guess they to get used to being a disc jockey. Right. And we had a good time doing that, but then when we got in the show, but we did make up some some things. Mm-hmm. Um, but my the thing that the the thing that I do the best is improvise. Yeah. Right. Oh, we got we had uh, an interview with Jackie Joseph too, and that was an interesting episode. She was Jackie on your show. Jackie Joseph. Yeah. Oh my God, Jackie Joseph and I were friends for years and years. Years. She was married to one of my best friends, Ken Berry. Yeah. Oh, God Ken bless Barry. him. God bless him. Yeah. God bless him. He was the most amazing guy and we 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 were in vegas together at the sahara uh-huh. oh. Ken Barry and i well we i got Uhu costello yeah wow i gotta find out because like i said i really like your your cheesy what, what you refer to as silly uh movies of the 60s you did two movies with connie francis who was a great singer the best she was an amazing sin- singer and i was co-starred with her did with you, Connie Francis. Did you ever consider? Did you ever consider going in and having a singing career yourself, Joby? Well, I, um, I'm a better singer now than I was when I was a, a singer. Mm. <laughs> when I was a nightclub entertainer, I sang. That was part of my act. Ah. Um, and then also Dory wrote a, sh- a movie. A, 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 a wrote a, a show. And she, there were, she sang her own parts as a demo, and she needed uh, someone to sing the male's part, and I sang uh, the male part uh, at a studio. Uh, very complicated music, and I think that was the best stuff I ever sang. Well, you must see Girl Happy because you actually get to sing a line by yourself. But not by myself. Did I sing anything by myself? You sang one line by yourself or, or something. I don't even remember what, I don't remember remember what, what the line was. Yeah, now. but but yeah. Oh, and I wouldn't sing anyway. I don't sing, so I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't re-sing it to you. I'm sorry, Joby. <laughs> now you were talking about great comedy teams. You were actually on the George Burns and Gracie Allen show. He was lovely, George Burns. Mm. And Ronnie Shell and I were friends, and I, I don't know how many of those I did, but I did a lot of them, I think. Now, in this show, you were friends with George and Gracie's son, Ronnie, on the show. Now, that was their real son. That's Is that what right? I said, Ronnie, Ronnie Shell. Oh, Ronnie, okay. I was mixing up Ronnie Shell with Ronnie Burns. Mm-hmm. Very good. Mm-hmm. I mean, wow. And then you, you were uh, with the amazing Red Skelton as well. Now, how, it's incredible. I, I didn't realize that I was such a hit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that when I did Red Skelton, um, I was a page at NBC? Really? No, I did not know that. Wow, that's perfect. So, one of my jobs was to to sit at the artist's entrance so the fans would not come through the line uh-huh. And bothered, you know, Dean and Jerry or Red Skelton or whatever. Right. And that was my job. And there was a beautiful redhead waiting for Red Skelton. And she said, I remember, uh, oh, she says, oh, Red, I'm just so happy to see you. You smell great. What do you have on? And he says, I've got a heart on, but I didn't know you could smell it. <laughs> Boy, it's stuff that like that. One of the most, that was the funniest line, extemporaneous line, I ever heard in my life. That, that, that's the funny stuff that should have been put on TV. Because <laughs> that, that's incredible. Wow. 
You know, I mean, I'm, you may have to you may have to bleep that, but I don't think. No, so. no, we're we're totally uncensored. I'm very surprised because you mentioned that, that we like these kind of movies, drive-in films. I'm really surprised that you didn't do a lot of work for American International. I never did any work with them. That's incredible. Wow. I'm, I I don't know how that did not happen. I mean, I would have thought you. Well, been, you know, at the time, I would have been happy to do anything for anybody. Because I was an actor that needed work. Right, right. Well, you were in probably what was the cheapest disaster film ever made. You were in a movie called Avalanche. Oh, my God, with Rock Hudson. Rock yeah, Hudson, Rock yeah. And, and that was a Roger Corman production. I mean, he's a, a low-grade b Well, movie. do you know that I was never that I was cut from the movie? Really? Because we haven't seen it all the way through yet. You were cut. You played a... Uh, uh, a director of, TV of director. a TV director, right? Yeah. I have no idea what I played. Mm -hmm. I, w I know that I was on, on location for a long time. Mia Farrow was in it too. Yes. yes. Yeah. And Robert Forster. And what? And Robert Forster. Now, he was one of my dearest friends, Robert Forster. I I felt really bad when he passed away. Yeah. We loved him. He was great. I was so glad he got. He wound Robert up in there. Robert Forster used to come over to my studio, and uh, we'd smoke dope together. In there the you old go. Days when, what? What'd you say? I said, "There you go." Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I I can imagine that that little green stuff in the bag uh, caused you to create some great paintings too, because we were told by an actress that that, that makes you very creative. Well, it doesn't hurt, let's put it that way. <laughs> and you know, it's crazy because, you know, once upon a time it was scandalous and now it's legal, so yeah, it's no big no deal. no big deal. <laughs> but you know, now that it's legal, it's not interesting to me anymore. There you that go. That is true. Because you got to live on the wild side of life. No, I really loved loved it when, you know, you used to, like, say, hey, do you have any of this, do you have any of yeah. that? And then, I mean, but who cares anymore? Right. Well, you're talking but about... Also, Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you were talking about Jack Klugman. You actually got to be on Quincy. That was a great show for Jack. Jack Klugman was the best. Some of the best dramatic moments on TV for me was working with Klugman. Yeah. Well, you didn't get to do The Twilight Zone, but you did get to do uh, Alfred Hitchcock a couple of times, too. I, I, mean, I did a few of those, yeah. yes. I mean, that's some yeah, real dramatic I, I, stuff. My God, it's amazing. That you know, I I googled myself to see what shows I did. I can't believe I did so many shows. <laughs> well, let me ask you. I mean, you did. In my little town, there we have a, a country store. It's closed now, but I'd come into the country store and have coffee in the morning, and the people from the town said, "Hey, I saw you on Gunsmoke." Yeah. I says, "I never did Gunsmoke." They said, "Well, your name was on the credits." <laughs> and I looked it up, and I had done Gunsmoke. Yeah. See this? All these years, now it's been so many years since you've done you know, anything for TV and movies, and people still recognize you. That's great. It is. I mean, I am astounded. I mean, for Ronnie, Ronnie has been in show business. He probably does nightclubs and has never stopped. Right. You know, yeah. that was his one thing. But... I, I can't believe that somebody would want to interview me. Well, you know, the thing is, and if anybody asks me what's it like doing what we do, and believe me, it's a great thing because that means they're a down-to-earth person, that a lot of actors that did stuff way back when can't believe that people still know them. And with reruns and everything, like, like my daughter uh, knows you from me introducing her to the old films. I'm an old guy. But I shared your stuff with her, and, and you get new fans all the time. That it, actors can't believe that they're still popular, but they are. What's your daughter's name? I'm his daughter, Tiffany. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. I keep thinking of a little teeny girl, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you were, Tiffany, once a little uh, teeny girl. Yes, and now not so much, but once upon a time I was, yes. Now, you said that... Now, what, what made you start this, you two? Uh, for me, it was just because I had always been around it. Even since I was little, he had been in radio and in, been interviewing celebrities for magazines before we started this show. And we said, well, if you're going to do it for there, might as well do it and merge the two together. And then I just started work. I started working with him when I was like 12. Well, tell me something. If you decide to do a radio show, how do you start that? How do you do that? 
Well, you come up with an idea, and then you figure out where you're go- how, where and how you're going to get it on the air, basically. Well, do you have, like, a sponsor that gives you money and stuff? At times, yeah. And then sometimes you have to just make it and take it through without any backing, too. It's, we're, we're, we're it's pretty... You know, of a, as, interesting, as interesting as I am to you, you guys are interesting to me. <laughs> You know, sponsors are great, but but the thing is, we try to be independent because sponsors try to tell you what to do, and I don't yeah. like to be told what to do because we're uncensored. No, that's that's true. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah, they do. That's like with you and your paintings; you can do what the hell you want to do now. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think that was very important to my life. Absolutely. Is, is there I any? I remember Procter and Gamble was the sponsor for Good Morning World. Yeah. And those guys in their suits were sitting out there uh, listening all the time. Yeah. But yes. that, that show did, that show did, I'll tell you, <clears throat> I got, I was so nervous doing that show. That's why I forgot my lines. And they insisted that everything they wrote was, I had to say, you know, and that got me crazy. Right. And they had they said, we want to see you in the office. So I went up to the office, and they were about to fire me, you know. Mm. That's true. And they said, you know, if you don't straighten out and stop all this nonsense, uh, one day Dave is going to be on his way to work and get hit by a bus. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> wow. Incredible. You can't write this I stuff have, either. I had so much trouble with the lines. Yeah, well. That on the weekends, I would have the actors come over to my house and run lines with me. And the more I did that, the more difficult it was for me. Right. But I never had trouble with lines before I did Good Morning World. Well, you were kind of laid back about it, but Ronnie Shell was really under a lot of pressure because he had left uh, Gomer Pyle to do that show and, and then come to find out your show got canceled so it had to be a, a thing for him I mean he's lucky Gomer Pyle took him back he, he got to go back to Gomer Pyle but. no that's that's very lucky for him yeah yeah, yeah. and, and a, Andy so, Griffith actually was on Good Morning World I mean he was associated with Andy Griffith and then Andy Griffith was on the show Andy Griffith was on my show yeah he was on Good Morning World he was. Yep. Yeah, you guys did an episode where you guys were hosting uh, a, telethon. A, a telethon, and you had a couple of celebrities that popped up for cameos. You know, you could believe that I never saw the show, because I don't <laughs> know what you're talking about. Maybe someday we will write the Joby Baker biography book. Yeah. Well, it's damn interesting if you want to know. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, You know, my, my, my wife asked me to write down uh, my life and I, I don't do it because I'm not interested in doing that but yeah. um, I was in Pearl Harbor during the war you know mm-hmm. when our house was bombed wow really yeah I came across the came across the ocean my mother and I uh, on a on a famous English a ship called the Aquitania that was turned into a troop ship. Oh, yes, yeah. And it took like a week and a half to cross the ocean because we were, they were dropping depth charges all the way across. Wow. Wow. So I, you Come really on. you really lived in Hawaii then? Of course I did. Because I know well, in Good Morning... I made that up? Well, well, Good Morning World, you guys supposedly came from Hawaii, and, and I, I guess... Well, I did. Yeah, yeah. you did. Wow, that's that's amazing. Well, you've had you've had an amazing life, Joby, and I'm so glad to hear that you're still active and you're still painting. That's that's fantastic. Well, I'm very glad to talk to both of you. I think what you got to do, Tiffany, is to move closer to Dad because it sounds like you're on the other side of the wall, on the uh, other side of the room, sitting on a chair somewhere. <laughs> He stuck me in the corner, Joby. That's what it was. He, he put me in timeout. See, she's not a little... Harry, t- can't you find a microphone with two heads on it? <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't afford it on our budget, Joby, so I have to let her sit on my lap. I understand that. <laughs>
<laughs> well, Joby, I, I, I totally get it. I want to thank you so much for spending so much time with us tonight. It has been such a joy to have you on the show, and uh, I hope that we keep in touch. Well, I'd be up to you. You call me anytime you want. Okay. It, it'd be great that. if you could be in California and come here and be in the studio. That would be fantastic. Yeah, that would be nice. I, my son lives in, in Los Angeles, and I've never visited him there. And I am from California. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you, how are you doing with this whole isolation virus thing? I mean, you're well, right? Yes. How about you guys? Are you okay? We're doing well, fine because we're used to hiding. <laughs> and, and as far as saying you have to stay home, I stay home all the time anyway, so it doesn't matter. But, well, so do I. I mean, having been around as long as you've been around, I mean, isn't this just crazy? I, I, I can't believe this is going on, and, and we've never no, seen anything I can't, like I can't either. Yeah. It's just amazing. I think that the great, the, the great senorita in the sky has caused this to happen to get rid of the president. There yeah, you go, and, and very I, well could be. I, that would be a good thing. Yeah. That would be a good thing for the country. But can you believe the people that have perished? No. Yeah. I mean, my God. Yeah, it's it's horrible. And then everybody is complaining about you know, oh, our right to go out of the house. No, no, no. Just stay home. No, and, no. Those, those people are the Trumpies. Yes. Don't even think about them. Exactly. Yeah. No Everybody's people. Saying. People with any brains realize we've got to, we've got to. Let let this virus come to its conclusion. Yep. Well, I hope you get uh, one of those stimulus checks because that's the only good thing that <laughs> that he did is to send those out and and. Well, I don't know if I will. I'll tell you, I did get a residual day before yesterday. Oh, nice. For ninety eight cents. You know, I've I've, <laughs> I've I've heard those stories. Tiffany actually got. One for yeah, I, I got a re I got a residual check one time for like twenty cents or something like that. I'm like, the stamp cost more. Why bother? It's true. It's true. The stamp costs more. <laughs> I, I think that was the least I ever got. Maybe I had one less than that. But as the years go by, they get less and less. I used to get a lot of money in residuals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But no, no, no more. <clears throat> um. I'm just this poor guy living on a farm and uh, being interviewed by all these people. <laughs> now, if people wants to uh, look at your paintings and buy them, you have a website, right? Yeah, Joby. I don't know how well set up my website is. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the paintings on that website aren't even mine, but the good ones are on there. It's jobybakerartist.com. Perfect. So let, let me ask you, because, you know, being a guy that's in radio, uh, do you have anything that I can afford? Because I would really love to buy one of your paintings, and I have basically no money. <laughs> I don't have any money either. <laughs> that, that's well, I tell you what, if you send me, tell you what, send me a big vanilla uh, Manila envelope with a return address and a stamp, and send it to me, and I will send you um, a book of monotypes I did uh, describing how it is to be a stand-up comic. Fantastic. Perfect. Wow. Perfect. I didn't know you put that out. Amazing. I don't put it out, but I have some. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, you know, I don't sell them. Um, uh, but I ran across a bunch of them the other day. But uh, they're really good. It's, they're done on the best paper, the best printing, and and I know that people have framed them all, and they look beautiful when they're all on the wall together. Very Fantastic. Cool. Well, we'll get you out here someday when you come to California, and we'll bring you and uh, Ruta Lee in the studio, and you can have a reunion for uh, Hoot Nanny Hop. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to see Ruta again, yeah. and uh, I think it was very nice of you to think of me. Absolutely. And, and I, I just and, and just do me a favor. Yeah. Yes. Don't ever do this again. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, see, now you're sounding like Billy D. Wolf. <laughs>
Mr. DeWolf, you, uh, you mean. Yes, Mr. <laughs> yes. DeWolf. Mr. Mr. DeWolf. Yes. And you know they never let him say picky, picky, picky on the show either. I don't know why, because that was that was his great tagline. But all right, well, Joby, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it, and I will be in touch with you uh, shortly. And have a great rest of your weekend. Okay, who who did the best interview, me or Ronnie? Oh, oh! Now I'm you're. Just, I'm just kidding, jo- <laughs> Joby. Don't put me in the middle between you and Ronnie. I'm Shell. not going to do anything like that. Anyway, I'm... what I've got to say to you guys is stay well and take care of each other, and and that's it. Absolutely, stay well, stay safe yourself, and uh, and we will talk soon. Okay, and if you talk to Rue, to give her my love, I absolutely, absolutely will. will. And and we'll also forward to Ronnie that you said hello. You don't have to do that. <laughs> I should give you Ronnie Shell's phone number so you can call him up. That would be nice. <laughs> well, guys, I'll talk to you later. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> have a great rest of your weekend, Joby. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Bye.